Welcome everybody to the Oasis Wednesday evening Bible study slash service. Uh, we uh, we're just so fortunate, or we feel fortunate to be with you tonight. I see all of you. It looks like you're popping up. Hey, how are you doing? Good to see you, church family. Um, good to see all of you. Don't forget to sign in if you can. I, uh, I just got a text before we started a few seconds ago, I guess, from Adrian. He, he doesn't sign in, but he wanted me to let everybody know he is watching, okay? So I see all the rest of you. Um, let's, 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 let's go to Lord in prayer and, and get in. We have good stuff for tonight, I think. I think God has something really for us tonight, so let's, let's go ahead. Father, we thank you so much for each and every individual, Lord, that's joined together tonight. And we know distance, distance is not an impediment in the spirit, Lord God, so we just praise you right now. Father, we thank you for weather that's favorable to uh, our, our uh, ministry tonight, Lord God, we thank you. Father, we just declare to the weather in the name of Jesus Christ that you'll be gentle, that you won't hurt, you won't come against our broadcast tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can worship together, so that we can break down the word together in Jesus' name. Um, Father, we just also ask that you would spread out your gifts and your graces among uh, the members, Lord, the, the, the body of Christ here at Oasis. I pray that you would just pour it out. Just pour it out, Father. Just bless everyone heavily with a new, fresh taste of the Holy Spirit, Father. And we just praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we go into the teaching, I want to remind everybody something that it just kind of came up to my mind. I wrote it down. I, you're hearing about the election, and we have our own ideas about how it's going to go and things like that. But I want to remind everybody that nothing is given and nothing is granted, and the church always has to pray. We have to pray for what we want. We can't just act like it's a done deal as far as elections go. The church has to get on their knees. We have to legally petition. We have to open that up before God for him to answer. We have to come before him and ask so that it may be given. And so we need to consistently thank God for what he's done, we need, and we need to continue to ask him for what we want, a godly leader. And so I just want to remind you, please take time every day take time every day in that regard um, we'll have more information about church Sunday we do have it set up to clean everything we're going we're going to get everything ready we are looking forward to having some kind of church Sunday I don't know how far apart we'll be in here we've kind of got to figure those things out but I'm going to get in touch with you about it but we don't quite have it out figured out tonight um, Oh, I see. We have some new people there. Hey, good to see you all. Good to see you all. Good to see you tonight. I, I hear it raining, and I know it's raining at your house, too. And, hey, fresh rain, you know, like you didn't have enough, right? Amen. But thank you, Lord, for gentle rain, for gentle rain. So tonight I had trouble, and I normally don't worry about it, but I did want to try to title this tonight. And I really had trouble with it. This is something that's so prevalent. And, and guys, you can, help me, you can help me stamp this out. You can help God stamp this out. It needs to really leave the church um, in, in general, the, the whole church, not necessarily Oasis. But we really need help going to the masses and stamping this out. Um, and so it, it, the thing about Christians, me, you, all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, is that we don't know what we don't know. Usually, that is a given in most things. It, it seems to be a given in a lot of fields, or, or let me say, at least it used to be. But in today's culture, there is this idea that you can become an expert in five minutes on, on, on anything. There seems to be, because we all have a YouTube, right? We all have a YouTube account. And there's a lot of things you can learn. And, and so maybe that's misleading that way. But what I want to say is the thing that we have to learn is that we don't know what we don't know. And um, the church is not always right. And I mean the church as a whole is just not always right. And I, and I want to talk to you about it. If you'll, in, in, if you'll look at it with me, if you'll scroll or turn now to Genesis 3, 22. 3, 22. 
This is after the fall, after Adam and Eve ate. Uh, and this is what the Lord said. Genesis 3, 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. All right, I want to stop right there. The man has become like one of us to know good and evil. He's become like one of us to know good and evil. Well, what's it saying? What's it saying? He's become like one of us. Well, first of all, um, it, it, the focus there is on the key. And let me, read a, let me read another one to you here just to give you some context. This is the Lord charging Adam. Eve's not on, in the picture yet. She hasn't been created yet. But the Lord is charging Adam. A lot of people forget, forget this. Um, we don't have any direct evidence that the Lord ever charged Eve with any of the information. And people tend to forget that. They tend to assume he told them both. But the biblical record in chapter 2 that is the close-up, not, not the expanded version that's in chapter 1, but the close-up in chapter 2 clearly shows that he told Adam, Adam, it says, verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Okay, so, In the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall surely die. And look at the next thing. And, and the Lord said, It's not good that man should be alone. So you see, Eve was not on the scene yet. And I just wanted to make that point. But what he's saying is there was a tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's a couple of things that we need to flesh out in that because we tend, if we're not careful, to automatically assume that that tree was very bad. And that's not the case because we know it's testified at the end of chapter 1 that God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. And that tree was a tree that he made. That tree was a tree that he made. So it was not bad in the sense that God created it. It was bad in the sense of Adam and Eve eating of it at a certain time. And that's what we need to kind of understand. So the tree in itself is not bad, but there is something that's that's important about it. Now, so Verse 17, don't eat of it. In the day you do, you'll die. Okay, now, Genesis 3, over a little bit, verses 4 and 5. Now the serpent has come on the scene, and he's come, come to Eve. And the serpent says to her in verse 4, uh, he had asked her about the tree, and it, she got it kind of mixed up, you know. And, and unfortunately, we see probably, probably the first religion that was ever created in, in all of man's history, as far as we know, going back to the beginning of Genesis 1-1, is right here with Eve. She creates the first guidelines. You guys know that's what I call this. She creates the first religious guidelines to protect her that go beyond what God has said, which all religions now, all denominations generally tend to have their own guidelines that are, that are, that are uh, more restrictive than what God said. Uh, let me give you an example. We were in a member of a denomination, and they were absolutely against drinking any alcohol, wine, beer, anything. If they saw you in the liquor store, they'd talk about you. Okay. Well, here's the thing. God hasn't said that. You know? Now, here's the other thing. Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding. If that was a sin, if it was a sin to drink it, certainly turning the water into the wine for the people to drink it would have been a sin. So, uh, but, but what we tend to do in religion is build restrictive guidelines to protect the people. Now, I want you to know, think about with COVID-19 and who's always trying to tell you you need man's protection. I got a clue for you. It's not God. <laughs> God's not telling you you need man's protection. And God's not trying to scare you into thinking you need protection. God's not trying to tell you you need more religion and more guidelines than what he's given to be safe. That's not God. That's the spirit of control, okay? So we look at that, and we can see it. But look at what, and Eve, of course, says, the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, of course, there were two of them. She's like talking about both of them here. God said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it. You know, God never told Adam that. We just read it. So there's religion for you. Don't eat it. Don't even get close to it. But look at verse 4. Then the serpent said back to her, 
you're not surely die you will not surely die um, and then in verse 5 for God knows that in the day that you eat of it your eyes will be opened you'll be like God knowing good and evil now we can go back to what I just read in verse 22 of this same chapter after they've eaten the testimony of God is this then the Lord God said behold the man has become like one of us to know good and evil stop okay obviously it's not talking about like God not what it's saying because we know from Genesis 1 26 and 27 that man was already like God man had been created in the representative image of God verse 26 the Elohim the Godhead you know it's interesting it, it's not Jehovah in in those when it says the Lord it's talking about it's Elohim it's plural and people say well, that actually means the angels because it's plural or God's talking with the angels the angels help make men no 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 it's plural because God is three in one and we were made in the image of the three in one Elohim or uh, Eloah singular God Elohim the plural the Godhead we weren't just made in the image of God we were actually made in the image of the Godhead and if you think about the Godhead what do you have father son and spirit okay we get that but think about this what you really have is spirit soul and body you have spirit which is what God is you have soul which is the mind emotions passion and intellect the manifold wisdom Ephesians calls it of God who he is you have his emotions does God get angry he can get angry sure he can does God get jealous yes he's jealous over Zion the Bible tells us is God so God experiences love he is love okay so God has God has a spirit he has a soul and of course he has a body and the son came in that body the word was manifest in that body Jesus so we were made in the image of the Elohim we are spirit soul and body the same way so just just as a side note to understand that so we were very much already like in the image created in the image of the shade of and what that really means in the Hebrew is a representative image or a representative of God so we know when he says in verse 22 behold the man has become like one of us or has become like Elohim you know he's not talking about becoming like a representative of Elohim because they already are so now we got to flesh out okay what's he saying here what is he really saying here so this is the key okay in the day you eat of it chapter 2 verse 17 in the day you eat of it you're gonna die you've seen it on some Italian movie and this is the way it goes the Papa the the patriarch he's standing there and the son has disgraced him or the son has done something that disgraced the family and the son comes in he says but Papa and the father says you're dead to me you're now dead to me and we all know what that means you might as well not even have the last name you have no inheritance you have no access you don't even belong you don't live here anymore we do not recognize you in the street we don't take your letters there's no need to call now think about that father God with his sons on the day you eat of it you shall surely die you will not be able to access God you won't have sonship you won't have you will not be able to access the ability of being a representative unit of God so what are we saying here we're saying that we will no longer be able to discern God's idea of good and evil now think about it what they did was go to a tree and when they ate 
they became supposedly like God, but that doesn't mean they became as God or in the image of God. They already were. What it means is in their minds, they became gods and started discerning for themselves what good and evil is. We lost the ability to know what God's idea, what God's plan for good and evil is, and we decided that we would discern that for ourselves. As a matter of fact, we only could discern it for ourselves because we totally were disconnected with the will, plan, and purpose of God, which is his idea of what's good and evil. Okay, so understand that's what God's saying here. Behold, the man's become like one of us, in other words, the man thinks he's like us. The man on his own now is trying to determine good and evil. He's not saying he's become like one of us. He's saying in the man's head, he's become like us. He thinks he can determine good and evil. I want to tell you something right now. Every man you've ever met thinks he knows good and evil. And every Christian you've ever met think they know good and evil. And most of the people we meet really have a very thin hairline. I mean, really, you could slip a piece of paper in there, folks. Idea of what God's really trying to do. And that's why it's a shame for us not to continue with God because we do not know what we don't know. And the interesting thing is, while we don't know all of the things we don't know, because we've become like gods in our head through the fall, we think we know. And I want to talk, tell you something that will make sense with you if you've ever tried to talk to another Christian and explain to them anything. They already know, right? They already know everything they need to know. They already know everything they need to know about salvation baptisms, all of those things, right? That's generally what you find out. It's very rare in talking to a Christian that somebody sits down and says, hey, I, I want to hear what you have to say. I will share something with you. We do a little research. You know, we have a YouTube channel, do a little research. Here's the thing. If on a channel or if on a video, you just give a nice testimony that warms the heart, many, many people will watch it. If on a YouTube channel you teach the deep or the, the, the heavy things of God and you really go into it, it drops off like a stone. Why would that be? People, A, already know they're not interested, and that's the deal. They already know or either they just really aren't interested. Think about this. Why is that? Why in the world are Christians not interested in the things of God? Somewhere, somehow, they've come under the delusion that all they need to know is one thing, how to be saved. That is one of the most dangerous doctrines in all of Christianity. Not getting saved, but the idea that that's all someone should know is very dangerous. Unfortunately, that doctrine is promulgated in many, many, many churches. It's taught Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and we never go forward. Over time, people lose a desire to know anything more about God. And let me tell you what's a shame about that. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to go to Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5, and I wish you would too, just to check up on me. We should do that. Hebrews 5, 11. Well, let's go to 12. Well, I tell you what, we should start at 11 because it's kind of what we're dealing with. So let's go back. If you will, just look back one verse. And um, now it's talking about Jesus. It says, verse 10, called by God as high priest. And then we go into verse 11, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain. Now, 
apostle, whoever wrote this, we think it's Paul, but who, whichever one of them wrote this, okay, by the Holy Spirit, he says, Jesus, of whom we have much to say or teach or explain, right? But, but it's hard to explain. Why is it hard to explain? Why is it hard to get a deeper doctrine, a deeper understanding out to the church? You ready? Here it is. Since you have become dull of hearing. Dull of hearing doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you can't hear. It means you've tuned everything out. Nobody's interested in knowing, listen, listen, they're not used to, they're not interested in, in the much that they have to say and the much that, that out there, the, 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 the plethora of doctrine, deeper teachings of the things of God, they don't want to hear it. They're not interested in it. And you can look on YouTube or on Facebook at videos that teach deeper things and you can see a lot less hits. Then if we just teach the good old things again, where we get all the amens, right? All the amens. And the Lord had to teach me that because that wasn't my ministry. I'm not against evangelism. I'm not against the goodness of teaching who Jesus is. Let me just tell you this, though. That only needs to be taught to people that don't know it. If you go to a place and they're teaching you something, and guess what? If you can amen it, the Lord had to teach me this because I got upset. Because early on in my ministry, I had an evangelist that I taught with, along with. And he would preach, and people would, amen, hallelujah, amen, and just go at it. And then I'd get up and preach, and they'd look at me like this, like, what? And so I, I went home. I got on my knees, man. I, I was fasting that, and I got on my knees. I said, Lord, what in the world am I doing wrong? Nobody's, nobody's fired up about it. Nobody, and the Lord told me, he said, hey. He said, people can't amen something. They're just learning. They have to go back and process it. He said, they're amening the other thing because they've heard it. They've already heard the good news of the gospel. When they hear it again, they can amen it. And that is good in a situation where one person or two people out of a whole church aren't saved. Because most people in the church meeting should be saved right <laughs> and so the lord had to show me that but that's something i want to make sure that's on the record for what we're talking about i'm not against preaching the basic gospel of jesus christ not at all that's what we should do but you don't keep doing it once people have heard it now let's back that up move over into hebrews into, into verse 12 of hebrews 5 there and we'll see this way he says and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read 11 again. You just stay at 12. Since you've become dull of hearing, for by this time you ought to be teachers. In other words, you should have heard this stuff so much, you ought to be able to teach this stuff. And yet, you need someone to teach you again. You need somebody to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, the word of God, the counsel of God. You need somebody to reteach you the first principles. You've come to need milk and not solid food. That's what we see. People preaching that same milk, same milk. Guys, it's, it's, a, it's a sad commentary on the church, on the state of the worldwide church, that so many people want that same thing again so they can amen it instead of learning something. I'm going to tell you, the reason you leave high school and go to college is because you've taught what they know in high school. The reason there's an English 102 instead of 101 is because they've, you've learned what they taught in 101 and you've passed it. Then you go to 102. I remember we used to say this. We used to say, when are we going to graduate from Sunday school and move into Sunday college? You know, it, it's really interesting. Nobody, nobody, for the most part, thinks about these things. But, but look at what the Word says about it. By this time, you ought to be teachers. You need somebody to teach you again. The first principles of oracles of God need to be taught to you again. You've come to need milk and not solid food. We know about babies. They need milk. They need a bottle. And this, unfortunately, is what people want. They want somebody to just, just take a bottle and just go, boom, just pop it in there and just let them go. They, people have come to where they don't want to hear preaching. They don't want to hear teaching. They already know. Just give me a bottle. Just give me a bottle. Let me amen it. That's all I need. Let me tell you why that doesn't work, folks. That is messing things up in the church. It's causing chaos in the church because I want to share something with you. And I saw this in the denominations that we were in, two different ones. You've got generations, generations of people 
that have not gone forward with God and don't know the Word of God. They don't really know the Word of God. They know the beginnings of it. They know that they're saved. They know that Jesus died to set them free from death and made them alive to God. They know that, and then that's what they know. And now they got born again at age 21 or 18, and they've been alive 60 years or 40 years since then, and that's what they know. And we have generation compounding on top of generation, compounding on top of generation and generation and generation. And this generation is teaching their kids just that and walking in just that. So the next generation has seen only that modeled. And the next generation has seen only that modeled. And the next generation has seen only that modeled. And how can they train their kids up in the way they should go when they've only seen the beginning? They only know how to take a bottle and stick it in their mouth instead of growing up and learning to enjoy steak. And it's literally what he says. You don't hear people talking about this much. Huge problem. Huge problem. We have to say these things so that people think about it and go, yeah, you know, I'm in that boat. I'm actually in that boat. I need to change that. God, according to the word, would want me to change that. So let's talk about it. This is what he says. Verse 12, you've come to need milk and not solid food. Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's just a baby. Let me say that again. I was just talking about all these generations, right? And you have one generation here, and they taught, they learned what? Milk. They ought to be able to teach their family and stuff by now, but you know what? They've come to need milk again because they didn't go ahead. They didn't go further. So guess what? Then you have a next generation built on that. Guess what they do? Same thing. Next generation. Same thing. Same church. Same knowledge. Same preacher. Hey. Here we go. Milk. Next generation. Milk. And I'll tell you something else that corresponds with this. If you're not, and you, 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 you look at it for yourself. But here's the thing. Same patterns. Same patterns. Same destructive things happen in their life. In their life. In their life. In their life. Same things. Same things continue. Not broken. Why? Because the way to break those patterns, the greater things that God has, the steak you can eat, they're not, you don't get them out of a bottle. And the same errors in thinking about Jesus, about the cross, the same lack of knowledge about the things of God, the same lack of knowledge are passed on. And what do you expect for the next one if we don't do anything about it? I think you know, don't you? So it's interesting. This is what's happening. This is exactly what's happening. The sad thing is it's almost a badge of honor to do the same thing each time. I want you to know the Bible says that God is increasing. The Bible never says that God has stopped. He says the increase of the Lord's kingdom shall have no end. What does that mean? If the kingdom's in you, then the kingdom in you ought to be increasing. You know, the, the command to man when he was in God's image, okay, before he fell from the image of God, in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, I want you to remember the first command, be fruitful. You think that's increasing? If a tree has no fruit and all of a sudden it grows, first year it's old enough, you know, first year has fruit. I had blueberry bushes first year I planted them. They're only that big. They had a few blueberries on them. Next year they got bigger, had more fruit, had more fruit, had more fruit, had more fruit. Here's the thing. In your mind, you think, well, at some point they're going to get old and they're going to die and I'm going to have to replace them. But remember, in the garden, there was no death. There was only increase. There was only production of fruit. You see, that's what God intended. Now, that's not what we got because we broke the plan. But that was the plan of God. That was his intent. 
the world he intended, as Hebrews 2 says, the world he intended was not meant to be under the control of angels. You know, it, it, it says, it says, it's been translated a terrible, terrible translation in that Hebrews 2 where it says, for God did not place the world to come under the direction of angels, but it's not to come. It says God did not place the world he intended under the direction of angels. In other words, it, the intent was for now. We're not talking about something later on. We're talking about now. But anyway, that's a, that's a side note. But look at it. Here we have the issue. You know these people. You and I know them. We love them. But we have trouble talking to them because they already know everything it takes to get saved. They're really not sure what else may be out there and they're scared of it. They don't want to get into that. And yet God encourages them to. As a matter of fact, we read right here, it's his will that they would. And they don't even know that. And why? You, because you don't know what you don't know. Until you're willing to break that spirit of fear and that spirit of religion. And understand that all God asks you to do is test fruit. He doesn't ask you to be afraid. Walk out there and see. Test it. And if it produces good, guess what? It's of God. Amen. So, but let's look at it together. Everyone, verse 13, chapter 5, Hebrews 5, 13. Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. How many generations unskilled in the word of righteousness. Now, if each generation had church leaders, let's say elders, deacons, and each generation had pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists, and they were all cut from the same mold, what do you think happened next time? What do you think happened next time? What do you think happened next time? What do you think they are now? You see why God has a problem with it. Now, here's the thing. They don't even know there's a problem with it. If you've ever tried to talk with somebody and enjoin them to a deeper truth, and you realize that they'll just talk in circles, they'll really just talk with you in circles because, A, they don't really want to go there, and it's outside their comfort zone. They don't understand it, and they're really not open to it. They don't even understand the teaching because nobody's ever even told them that there's more, right? And they don't understand. They, don't, they honestly probably don't know that Hebrews 5, this part we're reading, is even in the Bible. They don't know that God has more for them. They've never been taught it. Why? Because their elders or deacons or pastors or teachers or evangelists all cut out of the same mold. Right? Now, what's the problem with that? Well, I want to read a little bit more first so we'll see what God says about it, not what Lee says about it, what God says about it. So this is what he says. Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a baby. And then verse 14 says, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, not babies, not bottle people. They're of full age, that is, those who by reason of practice. Now, some of your New King James, King James will say reason of use, but the, the Greek is practice. In other words, you've been out, you've been doing, you've been working. See, and here's, that's what's so bad about the spirit of fear in church and the spirit of religion in church. Religion builds a safe barrier where you won't go out. Okay? Remember what Eve did. She said, we're not supposed to eat from that tree. Not only are we not supposed to eat from it, we're not even supposed to get close to that thing. Now, see, God had not said that. And, but that's what we hear so many times is, oh, well, that doctrine they preach over there, you know. No, we're not even supposed to get close to that thing. Those, those people are weird. They're of the, you know, they're probably of the devil. That, that thing, I mean, they're good people, but, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. They'll lead you, they'll lead you astray. Folks, the Bible is clear. You've not been given a spirit of fear. You've been given a spirit. In the last part of it, you've been given a sound mind, Right? A sound mind. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit is giving you the ability to walk right up to that tree and discern it. You don't have to be scared to get near it. He's giving you everything you need to walk right up to it, discern it, and in your own mind, to yourself, 
determine what it is and then walk away. It can't grab you. And yet that fear has been perpetrated, unfortunately, by people that didn't know generation, 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 generation. So let's look at the rest of them. Verse 14, solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, who by reason of use have their senses exercised. Now look at the rest of it. To discern both good and evil. Now here's my point. You would think that if a person could automatically determine good and evil based on what they think there could not be a verse in scripture that says Christians could not that there in other words you couldn't find a verse that could possibly say that a Christian could not discern good and evil. If just all you had to do was just get born again, just put that bottle in your mouth and take that first milk of Jesus Christ. And that's what, guys, that's what a big percentage of the church believe. Well, I'm saved. I know what's right. No, you don't. Because you don't know what you don't know. I don't know what I don't know. That's why I listen to teachers that challenge me. And I go back and I test. I listen to prophets that prophesy. In other words, they preach the word of God from the spirit of God. And I test it. I want to see. I expect to see. And I expect the word to give me witnesses, two or three, and it to testify that the Holy Spirit, James said we have an anointing in us that teaches us. He said you don't need anybody to teach you. Now what he was saying was, he obviously wasn't saying there wouldn't be teachers in the church because they're one of the five offices. What he's saying is you're going to be able to discern it by that anointing because that anointing is going to testify in you when, it, when you hear it and you know the word of God. Now listen, I, gotta, I want to get a caveat here. This does not work if you're a babe. If you're a babe and you're on milk, like all these generations. So I'll, let, me, let me be clear about this. Age doesn't matter. You cannot look at a moral, ethical man that goes to church that's 70 or 80 years old and look at them and say, man, that's a great Christian right there. That's a fine. They may be a fine man and very moral, but it doesn't mean, hear me now, it doesn't mean that they are able to discern both good and evil in terms of what God thinks is good and evil. That's what we got to lift out of this. We got to teach to people because I've, I've been around a lot of good folks, good Christian folks in my life in the churches I've been in. And I hear them talk, man, this, this fellow, you know, he really, he's a Christian, man. He's a good man. And you know what? They don't know what they don't know. And neither does the person they are talking about. <laughs> you see now look at verse look at chapter 6 verse 1 therefore and look at what the writer says leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ can you believe somebody in the Bible actually says that you would think that that would be um, a heresy to suggest in church that we leave that milk that's been perpetrated and well, perpetuated even from generation, 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 and move on. You would think that was a heresy, but your thinking would be wrong. You would think that's an evil statement, but your thinking would be wrong because you don't know what you don't know. And what you don't know is that Hebrews 6 tells us we should. This is what it says. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection or to maturity, to completion of Christ. Let us go on, not laying again foundations of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, the doctrine of baptism, or baptisms, I need to be specific, of having laying on of hands or the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will do if God permits. Well, God has permitted because it's been about 2,000 years since he wrote this. Now, whether we've done it or not, 
I know the writer said he was going to, and his church and his followers were going to. But whether we've done it or not, I think, still remains. Now, there are different groups, obviously, so we can't. That's not for us to uh, give an opinion on. But what we can do is look at ourselves, and we can hear what God's saying. Amen. So let's do that. Um, now, here, here's the problem. If you have generation after generation after generation after generation and, and, and assume to come another generation that are leaders in church, they're influencers in church, they're, they're praise and worship leaders, they are they're youth leaders, they are uh, Bible teachers, they are, I mean, you know, Sunday school, they're, they're teaching bi vacation Bible school, they're doing all this good work for the kingdom. But if it's all the same milk and we can't get anything else in there, what we're doing is raising churches, and we have churches today filled with good-intentioned people that are saved, okay? They are born again. They're being saved. They're, they're sons and daughters of God through redemption in Jesus Christ, but they really cannot discern God's idea of good and evil. Their discernment is based on their own discernment. They're basing it on the discernment that Adam and Eve received when we fell. That's a deceitful discernment that's the discernment of the natural man and i want to tell you i would say and you make your own judgment based on what you've seen i would say that most of the christians that i know use that discernment they use that discernment and not only unfortunately do they use that discernment but they get on social media and they perpetuate that discernment. And so, guess what that does? God has his idea of what's good and evil, and that gets thrown to the curb, and we instead we perpetuate our idea or the natural man's idea. You know what that does? It confuses everything. It makes a mess of the work of God. And you have Christians, good people, stepping on other Christians. It's a shame, and it needs to stop. It really needs to stop. I'll give you an example. Uh, if you, in case you don't believe, I'm going to go to John 18, 14. Just read one verse, and then I'll go over to Matthew. But I want you to know this is about Caiaphas, the high priest. And look at what Caiaphas says. In John 18, 14. Or look at what the word says. Now it was Caiaphas, the high priest, who advised the Jews that it would that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And you know who that man was. I'm sure it was Jesus. So Caiaphas had this idea that, and, and believe me, Caiaphas didn't know that Jesus was Messiah. He did not believe that Jesus Messiah, or he would not have consented to kill him to hang him to for him to be, be crucified so we know that for a fact and so here's the point christians or people of god in general and, and it applies to christians today we just don't know what we don't know and caiaphas was using the best he knew good and evil to try to determine i want to give you an example in matthew 26 57 there's a, there's here, here's the evidence and um, when those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were assembled, okay? And they looked for, it, it goes on to say in verse 59 that they sought false testimony because they really didn't have anything on Jesus, but they just didn't believe he could be the Christ, you see? And they had decided that he needed to die because he would wreck the church, they had made up their mind that it was best or that it was good and not evil to even kill this man because in their minds, he was going to wreck God's church. He would split God's church and make a mockery of God's church. You see, they were trying to do the godly thing as best they knew. But guess what? The problem with that is you just don't know what you don't know. And they weren't really open to Jesus. And they didn't really ask, did they, what he meant. They really didn't. And, you know, this is just an example. I'm not saying this would have gone any other way. But I want you to see what it's like to believe you're doing a good thing. 
to believe with all your heart that what you're doing is best because they felt like this was entrusted to them, you see. And then if you just look at it, Caiaphas finally uh, found a false witness. Verse 61, a fellow came and said uh, that, that Jesus said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it again in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? And Jesus didn't say anything. And the high priest then said, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus told him, he said, it is as you, it, it is as you have said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you'll see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven then caiaphas the high priest tore his garments saying he spoke in blasphemy in verse 50 in verse 67 you see that they decided or in verse 66 that jesus was deserving of death now understand that understand that you don't know what you don't know you might very well be going against god now of course most folks are not going against God, and the heaviness of it is no match to that, okay? But let's, let's be clear. Every time a person that takes the name of Jesus, every time a person that's a Christian, that's a church person, does something, they're either gathering or they're scattering. There's no middle ground. You're either gathering or you're scattering. Jesus didn't say there are gatherers and there are scatterers. Then there's all those good middle people. He said, you're either with me or you're against me. You're either gathering or you're scattering. So we can believe that in the word. Now, again, we don't know what we don't know. So if we've not thought about it, guess what? We've probably been scattering, even though we're really good people, really good Christians, and we only mean well, and God hasn't, guess what? He hadn't thrown us out of heaven. He hadn't thrown our salvation away, but he is trying to work with us, and it's awfully hard because we're stepping on everybody else's feet. Because we're running around in the church trying to do what's good and not what's evil. But we're not using God's knowledge of what's good and what's evil. We're using ours. So guess what? We're falling short. We're falling short. Now, if you don't believe me, I'm going to give you the example here. And then we'll just name a few examples. And uh, then we'll pray. But I want you to see this. If you don't believe me, you don't know how serious this is, please call me, email us, get, you know, send us something on, on, on the channel. I'll be glad to give you my references again. Or you can just listen to it because you can listen to the tape again and again and test it for yourself. But this is what Romans 12, 2 says, okay? It says, brethren, and I'm adding that because it's in, it's in verse 1. Romans 12, 2, brethren, do not be conformed to this world. All right, here's the thing. When Adam and Eve fell, they were conformed to the world. And their ideas of good and evil became their own. They became the, their own discerners of good and evil. They, be, they, they became, in their minds, the ones who had to perceive good and evil. Now, you know why that was, right? Because after they ate, their eyes were open. They saw they were naked. And I want you to know, if you've seen this show, and I'm sure you have, there's a show called Naked and Afraid. Why don't they just call it Naked? Because there's something about being absolutely naked and having no weapons, no provision, no nothing, to be totally naked and afraid or totally naked and defenseless. And, when, and the naked in the Hebrew, in Genesis, when it says they realized they were naked, that intonation is that they were totally naked, totally bare, and totally defenseless. When they realized that, in the mind of the man... He began at that moment to make his own decisions about what was good and what was evil. In other words, how to protect himself and what was good for he and his and what to stay away from and what would harm him and what might kill him. Christians are supposed to have been raised back out, redeemed back out of that mindset. And if you'll listen to our tape on the threefold redemption of man, you now begin to understand the importance of the second step. That is renewing of the mind unto transformation. Because God doesn't just change your mind. He, he, he gives you the right to change it yourself. He gives you the right to conform to the image of, of God. So here's the thing. 
Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, how, what would that have to do with being able to interpret good and evil? Well, it tells us. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove. You remember that word by practice? They're able to discern Hebrews 5 that we were reading at the end of Hebrews 5. They're able by practice or through use to discern good and evil. Here it is again. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is God's good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Do you understand? If we don't transform our minds, if we're not renewed to transformation, then we are a Christian that's probably at odds on many levels with what God's trying to do because we're using natural discernment to discern good and evil. Now, I'm going to stop there. I think, I think we've gone, but I'm, I'm going to give you an example or two. Try to. Um, in, in, in what, what do we do? We use the natural so many times, right? Um, we were, we were, we knew a pastor and, and he and his wife seated a church. Now, in, in this particular case, that gentleman uh, at some point gave up all his income and was, was trusting in the little church to, to make make ends meet and they really weren't they didn't even have health insurance at the time and it was the habit of that particular congregation to take up an offering i guess once a year or something and and they would give it now here's here's the natural good and evil of man right they had they had other ministers that were volunteers that would come in an hour or two you know a week and and minister so they took up this offering and they divided it equally between these ministers now that sounded fair and it sounded right. And to most people, they would never think anything about it because we don't know what we don't know. But the fact is, the pastor who had seated the church, who didn't even have health insurance, couldn't make ends meet and needed the money. The other ministers all still had their full-time jobs and had benefits. So the fairness principle didn't work. But if they had gone to the word of God and been renewed, it would have made sense. But we don't know what we don't know. So what happens? Ministry suffers or families suffer or orphans suffer. You see, people suffer because we really don't know what we don't know. Let me give you another example. Um, deacons and elders. I'll give you an example. Part of denominations over the years and course we don't know what we don't know so what would generally speaking if i were really honest we would pick deacons and we would pick elders and we would basically base it on the natural are they good in business are they a leader in the community okay yes that's who we would generally elect now think about this what are the requirements in the word there are a lot of requirements in the word in Timothy and other places for deacons and elders that God lays forth and that Paul laid forth for us. Looking back, how many deacons and elders met those requirements? For a deacon, the Bible clearly says in Acts, a deacon should be filled with the Holy Spirit. How many denominations don't even purport in the whole denomination to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You can't understand the things of God if you're on milk. You can't understand it. So what does that mean? I'll give you a last example here. Church plants. I'll give me an example. There's a move right now. There's a move out there. And, and, and it's this. It's, it's, it's a certain movement of people that are Christians. And the idea is this. Just anybody, whoever you are, just start a church in your house. If we can get families to start churches, then we're fulfilling the Great Commission. And I, I want to share this with you. It's a mess. They're stepping on top of each other. I want, to, I want you to consider this with me. First of all, God did not call people who aren't pastors and evangelists to start churches. People who aren't apostles do not start churches. They don't preach in churches. People that are called do those things. And yet, these people, have they, they, they don't care anything about those things. Why? Because you don't know what you don't know, and it's purported. I mean, you can find scripture where, uh, you know, a guy said, hey, Lord, let me follow you. I want to preach. Here's another thing. A guy wanted to preach. 
in Scripture. And Jesus looked at him and said, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send workers out into his harvest. He didn't say, you need to just go. Go on. Obviously, that wasn't that person's call. But yet, if we were telling people, hey, just start a home church. If you can get eight people to start coming, it'll be another church. It'll be fulfilling the Great Commission. But the problem is, now think about this with me. Do you really think there's a town in the world that's not on the mind of God? Do you really think that there's a hamlet anywhere in the world that God doesn't have a plan for, that God's not raising up a minister, that he's not crafting an evangelist or an apostle or, or a pastor to go to that place and start a church, and they're the right person with the right spiritual equipping, and they have the right mind and ability that God has created for that place? And yet you have Christians, right? But they are only on milk. So they go into that place and they start eight home churches, just random with, with nobody called. No, no, no. We just need to, we need to fulfill this great commission. We got to do it. We got to do it. Don't matter how we do it. We just got to do it. And so what happens? All those people that should go were this pastor trying to start this church. And they're scattered among eight other churches and they never see. And it never takes place. And again, they don't lose their salvation. But guess what? The Bible says, don't be conformed to the ways of the world. Don't be conformed to the good and evil that you learn from the wrong tree. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind to the word, in other words, that you may prove God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. Guys, guys, church. We've got to come in and become, we've got to move on, become mature, become some meat eaters, carnivores of the word of God. It's sad when you look at YouTube and you look at the people that preach the deeper things of God and they don't have the followers. They don't have the, they don't have the thing. It, it's sad. I, I was looking at guys that I look up to, that I listen to their teaching. And then I, then I, then I look at people that are more evangelistic in nature and you can just tell people are not interested in the deeper things of God. I want to tell you what that spells for the church is. That spells that the church can't be in unity of the spirit. I mean, we, can't, we can be in unity of the spirit, but we can't be in unity of the faith. Because the faith is brought out by all aspects of the word, not just the milk. You see, we come in, we're born of the spirit when we get the milk, so we have the unity of the spirit. But the unity of faith and the maturity of the man of Christ comes through the fivefold office, through the teaching of deeper things. And it's such a shame to see a church that's languishing one after the other, after the other, after the other, generation after generation after generation, when God has such good things, not only for them, but for his, his church in general, the world over. So I want to encourage you to help me, help us reach out and get these truths to people. Help us get it out there. People need to know. And we want to put it out there. We want to get it out there. We want to love on people. And I tell you, if you go to Oasis, you've seen a taste of, the, of God's protection. You've seen a taste of the power of God. I was just looking the other day, watching through our uh, healing testimonies from five or six years ago. And it was just, it's just amazing the healings that would blow through because people believed and we would lay hands on them, anoint them with oil, and they'd be healed. Um, so we want to get that out, though, out of Oasis into the world that doesn't have it. Folks, everybody needs what you have. Everybody needs what you have, and we need more. We need to learn from people who have more than us. We need to go get it and bring it, and that's what we're trying to do. But let's be a part of the move, of the move of God on the earth to make the church great. Please join me in that. Join me in growing. That's all we want to do. We want to become lovers of his word. We want to become students of his word so that we're in lockstep with God, not out where man dwells with his own ideas. Amen? Let's do that together. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given us the ability 
to be a part of the ministry of reconciliation. We bless your name, Jesus. We say you're great, you're wonderful, you're worthy to receive honor and glory, dominion, power, and praise. Father, we pray that everybody that hears this message gets a new level of joy, a new level of expectation, that they go to that word and the word begins to feed them and build them from the inside out, Father God. I thank you that they are made strong from the inside out. That even though death comes upon them each day on the outside in the flesh, that your life on the inside continues to burn bright. Father, we praise you that you're above all things, that you're beyond all these things. We love you and honor you. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who reigns forever. Amen. We look forward to seeing you soon, but if not, we'll see you in heaven.